Okay, so Hades 2 is uh, heading into its first public testing. Um, it's its first public technical test, which is like a few people have gotten access to it, some games journalists and a, f a bunch of players just to sort of test whether the game works at all. And then it's going to open up to early access at some point later in the year. Um, I don't think I will try the game in early access. I don't think I'm going to try, like, I'm gonna, not going to try and get into the technical test. I'm not going to try and do early access for it because... Well, number one, I have a million other things I need to do. <laughs> I have so... I have so, so, so many other games that I'm trying to play through. I'm trying to finish Baldur's Gate 3. I'm trying to finish Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I want to go back and finish Final Fantasy 16. I want to get back to Final Fantasy 14 streaming because I kind of want to catch up a little bit on that before Dawn Trail comes out. And I have some plans for that also that I want to do on, on, on my fucking stream because it's one of my favorite things that I ever stream and I just don't do it enough. So with all of that, I can't... I cannot, I can't dive into Hades 2 as well, because I remember from Hades 1 how obsessed I got with that game, how good it felt to play, how much I just wanted to play that all the fucking time. Um, and apparently Hades 2, by the looks of it, is going to be even better, so that, no, 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 absolutely not, absolutely not, I cannot do that, I need to, I need to... I need, to, I need to, like, do my work first, I need to finish up my vegetables before I can have my dessert, so... Probably not going to be playing Hades 2 for a while, but I can at least do a reaction to some of the gods, some of the artwork that has been revealed for the game. Like, yeah, we can do that and compare them to the uh, to the gods of Hades 1 to see how, like, some things have changed and see if we can do some commentary and, and reaction on, on the changes in style. Um, and we'll start with our new Zagreus, our protagonist, Melano, who, like... Like, because she is the Zacharias, right? Like, because she's the protagonist of the game, and because she is literally Zacharias' little sister, I can't help but compare her to her brother, right? Like, and sort of think in terms of, like, how how they will be different as protagonists. And the first thing that strikes me about Melano is that she seems a lot more severe than her brother. Um, a lot more utilitarian? Like, a lot more practical-minded. Because Zacharias... At least to me, the way that he was dressed, the way he was conceptualized, always, like, he was a little bit of, like, a fuck-up prince, right? Like, that was sort of the vibe of Zacharias, is that he was this, like, this god princeling of the underworld who's never really been able to find his place, never really been able to figure out where he fits in or where he belongs or what he's supposed to do with himself. And he's always, like, so he wears this, like, robe that's, like, sort of loosely, comfortably slung around his waist. And, like, he has this little smirk on his face and he has, like, this disheveled hair and, like, the three skulls on his shoulder that's a little bit theatrical a little bit a little bit casual a little bit laid back a little bit sort of sort of easy going in the general vibe that he has and melano is not like that melano to me does not seem easy going in the least about like, <laughs> about anything her outfit is first of all looks a lot less comfortable right like not that it looks like uncomfortable or anything but like this looks less like she's wearing it because like oh this is like a nice fit on me i feel good and i can really sort of relax i can slink back on my like couch and just take a nap like this feels more like like something that she wears because this is practical for her like with the with the strong cut off to, to cut off to leave the arms really open so like she has the maximum freedom of movement the very short skirt so that it doesn't interfere with her like if she wants to like do some kind of athletic movement with her legs um it feels like very much more like this is i need the to be cover, have i need to cover my my body so this is this will do and then f as for the rest of it it's much more like utilitarian in the way that she's put together at least that's my first impression of her um then there's like the things that connect her to various parts of hades lore like the eyes for example the heterochromia which is something that she shares with zagreus except she has it in reverse where zagreus's right eye is like hades red and his left eye is persephone green she has it the other way around she has her left eye hades red and the right eye persephone green which like is that an indication that the siblings are kind of mirror images of each other? That there's sort of like, that there's sort of two sides of a coin kind of vibe? Like they sort of reflect their parents in opposite ways, maybe? Um, I'd be curious about that. Like this, the, the degree to which... Okay, I thought my cats were about to have a fight. Um, the, the, the degree to which their personalities are reflections of one another, right? Because Zachary is in the first game he was very much a character who was like his story was about learning to find his place in the world right like learning to find um, his home in the world and for him that meant 
rebuilding his home where it was, like getting his father and mother back together, like mending their broken relationship, and then in turn himself also mending his broken relationship with his father. Um, and that sort of like helped him find his place as the god of blood and like, um, like as, as like the god who always tries to escape hell but always fails. Like that's so it sort of gave him this mythological role to fit into that, that gave him like a fulfillment of family. Melano. I wonder if she has kind of the opposite thing, that she starts the story knowing exactly what the fuck she wants to do with absolute certainty, which is kill fucking Kronos. That, like, because that seems to be her whole personality in the in the little snippets that I have seen so far is like, kill Kronos, Kronos must die, death to Kronos. Like, that sort of seems to be her whole thing. And that maybe her thing is like learning to lighten up and discover what she is beyond her purpose. Right, like where Zachary has only had stuff that wasn't his purpose. Um, and then had to learn his purpose. She's the one who has to learn to find something outside of her job, <laughs> something outside of her mythological duty um, to hold on to, like like love a family, for example, like to sort of relax into the bosom of their care and the care of others, something like that. Who knows? That's just my vibe, like my feeling based on how opposite the two siblings kind of seem in the way that their character designs are put together. Like, even the expression and, like, the, the pose, right? I know this is not Melano's key art from in-game. This is key art from, like, the promotional art from way back when the, when the game was first revealed. Um, but, like, Zacharias' general attitude was always, like, reaching out with a hand, right? Like, that was always his thing, is, like, reaching out with a hand all the time. Like, oh, well, come on. Yeah, surely. Um, him. Like, he was always kind of laid back, charming, always had that little smile playing on his lips. Melano, on the other hand, is like, I have two ways to kill you. You can pick which one you want to die from. <laughs> like, she seems more severe. She seems a lot more stark. She seems a lot more vengeful. Um, which is understandable, given, given given what Kronos has done to her father. Um, so there's that, right? Then we have... We'll talk about the arm later. Then we have the belt. And the belt associates her specifically with Hecate. And we'll talk about Hecate. Um which seems to be, like, her sigil, her symbol. And, like, there's a lot of the accessories that Hecate wears, like the half moons, like the little things that hang off the belt, the green tassels, that Melano also shares, including the multicolored ribbon thing, um, the rope that's around Hecate's hat, is basically the same kind of thing that she has around her leg. So, like, those are all things that connect her to Hecate, um, who's her master, her teacher, her surrogate mother figure, I guess, for the for the uh, purpose of the game. Um, where was I going with that? Right, um, so there's this thing of, like, there's many parts of her character design that are calculated specifically just to connect her with other characters, right? Like, that's what the eyes are doing, are connecting her to, like, Zagreus, to Hades, to Persephone, the belt... And, like, a lot of her her accessories are connecting her to Hecate. And so then I'm wondering, what's with the half-moon symbol on her head? Because, like, that... We know Selena is in the game. We'll, we'll look at her artwork later. In fact, let me go and try and find her. I have her here somewhere. Don't I? Yeah, there. That's Selena's symbol, right? Like, so Selena and, and Hecate presumably have some kind of connection where the moon or moon magic or something along those lines is like intricately or intimately connected with the kind of magic that Hecate practices. But she does have like the Selena symbol right the fuck on her forehead, which implies like like a real dedication to that particular goddess, which I think is interesting. Um, and I wonder about that. Like, I wonder how that's going to play out. Um... Outside of that, right, um, Persephone, right? Persephone and Hades, the connections there, where on the side with the Hades eye, right, we have also the coolest fucking feature of her character design. I left it to last un intentionally, which is the bone arm, the translucent bone arm, which is so fucking cool. Like, come the fuck on. Come the fuck on. <laughs> That fucking rules. You can't tell me that that doesn't rule. That That's just, as a character design feature, that's like... Yes, this is the thing that makes her a protagonist character, like, instantly. That's the thing that makes her, like, a main character, is that she has the one arm with the, that's translucent with the skeleton inside it and the bone. Fuck yeah, that rules. But other things I notice is that the hand with the bone inside it also has this claw-like aspect to it, like this more jagged, sort of, like, sharp with the long nails thing. Then her other hand, which is, like, visibly seems to be a lot softer, and wouldn't you know it, Hecate also has that sort of claw hand 
um, with like the long nails and the kind of sort of slightly skeletal aspect to it. And I wonder to what extent that means that this is something that's connected to Hecate's magic, right? Or this is something that's connected to magic in general, or like what the significance of that means, if if any significance at all. Like maybe it's just sharp because it's the cool, scary bone arm. The other thing is that like Zagreus, um, she's half Persephone, half Hades, right? So she's half connected to the Chthonic gods of death and half connected to Olympus. Um, and she's half connected to death itself and she's half connected to life, right? Which is something that I also feel like, again, this is promotional art. I don't know that she's going to be using these weapons in game, but the sickle is a harvesting tool. Like that's a thing for like, for like harvesting crops and like making food and shit like that. And then the dagger is for killing people. Like this, this is this is not like a this is not a paring knife. This is not for cutting up a feast, um, or like 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 some meat for a meal. This is a killing knife. This is for murdering. Whereas the sickle is specifically a harvesting tool, which is like oh that there's a connection to Persephone there, right? Um, which I wonder about that. Like I wonder to what extent her duality as both a daughter of Persephone and a, and a child of Hades is going to come through because Zacharias was always more his mother's son, right? Like that was always, Zacharias was always more lighthearted. He was always more fun loving. He was always more sort of like, like emotional and open and artistic in the same way that his mother was. And I wonder if perhaps Melano here is going to take after her father a lot more and be much more repressed and kind of like, kind of like um, have difficulty with her feelings and difficulty expressing herself beyond like simply doing what she thinks is right. Uh, like, so I, I, I wonder to what extent, like, the duality between her two parents sort of comes into play with her as a character. Uh, I'm curious about that. Anyway, that's initial reactions. Then there's Hecate. Hmm. Hecate. So, <laughs> they know what they're doing, um, and they're doing it on purpose. So 99% of Hecate's character design, right, is wizard, right? It's like wizard, witch, Magic caster, magic use, like classic, all of that stuff with the big hat and the cloak and the robes and like the long skirt and like the tassels and the mystical accessories and all of that. And then crop top. <laughs> like, a, a, like a crop top comfortably showing off just like the most ripped fucking gym six pack you've ever seen. You could grind meat on there. Like you could, you could fucking, you could grind beef on that thing. Just rock solid hard abs right there in the middle um which like that is definitely a conscious subversion right like that's definitely we're we're fucking with this on purpose um kind of vibe where normally when you have a wizard right like when you have a magic caster of some kind it's like oh yeah they are frail they're a little bit physically weak they're slow they are not very agile and they wear like big heavy robes and they're they tend to be very covered up in general. So this to me reads like a very intentional subversion of saying like, no, 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 no. Hecate could crush you, your skull with her hands. She doesn't need to cast a spell on your ass. Um, like subverting the idea of like the weak, frail, like physically um, vulnerable wizard type or witch type. And sort of like, sort of just saying, no, no, this is something else. Hecate is a different kind of spellcaster. She's a different kind of archetype, right? That like, they shouldn't confuse her with the idea of like an old wizened crone. This is, this is someone who has got like strength and power physically as well as magically. And like, it does make her look powerful, first of all, like just by sheer virtue of like showing off like these really tight ripped muscles. It's not really like when you look at strong women, like pe like women who actually sort of like like do feats of strength ath athletically, this is not really what their bodies tend to look like. They tend to have more fat on their bones because like and they tend to have like thicker cores rather than these very sort of sort of like um, vacuum sealed, very tight, very like rigid cores. Um, but like it gets the point across, right? Like that this is a character of power. Um, the other thing is the rest of, of her character design still leans fully into wizard, right? Like, she so she has the mask over her face. Where most of her face is hidden, that makes her distant. Like, that's a very basic character design thing. It's like, if a character's face is fully visible, if you can really see their eyes, you can see their expression, that makes them relatable, that makes you feel like you can connect with them, like their feelings are obvious to you, like you can read them, you understand what they're feeling, how they're do what they're doing. Um, and if you hide a character's face, you deny people access to that emotional information about them, right? So you deny people access to their emotional state, to their expression, to the way that they might be feeling. 
and that makes them distant. That alienates them from the viewer a little bit, and it makes them mysterious, right? Like, so Hecate, with the big hat and, like, the huge cloak sort of covering up most of her body and the mask and, like, the one arm that's mysteriously wrapped up, unlike the other one, she looks like a character who has secrets, right? Like, this looks like a character who is who's who knows a lot more than you do and who's not going to let on and who's not going to sort of, sort of, like let you know what's going on inside of her head at any given time, at least not all of it, right? Like, she looks like someone who, who's always holding something back, among other things, like the power, like, holding back her powers, like, to one-tenth of her full potential so that she doesn't crush you immediately. Um, or whatever. And I like that. Like, I like the subversion. I like the very clear, like, no, 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 fuck your archetype, we're doing this differently, of just having that crop top... <laughs> like window with just the shredded fucking abs on this wizard swamp witch ass motherfucking character um i really quite like that as an idea um i'm also curious about the mask on her shoulder like because like characters wearing stuff on their shoulders is like that's hades do does this all the time zagreus wears like the three skulls on his shoulder in parts like to signal his connection with cerberus right? like it's sort of like that he is also much like cerberus is one of the guard dogs of hades ultimately right um that's where he ends up um so like this idea that that like shoulder ornamentation has some kind of meaning to the characters in hades is not new at which point I wonder, what does that mask mean then? Because, like, with the laurel wreath around the head and, like, the half-moon sigil down here, I wonder whose face this is. Like, is this something that connects somehow to Hecate's source of power? Is it something that connects to her past? Like, is this something that actually tells us something about who she is and, 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 and what she is? Um, I don't know, but it just caught my eye as, like, notable that a character who hides her face wears a full face mask on her shoulder, right? It would be very funny if this was, this was Hecate's face, actually. Um, that I found curious. Um, I also like her hair. Like, I hope we, like, I wish we get could get to see a little bit more of that, because that seems like a cool part of her character design, that she has this very long hair, like, broken up into multiple braids. Um... Which, like, I wish we could sort of see that flowing out from behind her a little bit, or get some sense of, like, how the hell it's coming out from under her cloak. <laughs> um, she's also, like, powerful, like, stately, in the sense of, like, the cloak, specifically, I would read as a signifier of power, right? Like, a character who wears, like, a big, heavy, draping cloak like this, like, that's a, that's a, that's a monarch, that's a, uh, that's a powerful wizard, that's some kind of, 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 like, official, that's someone who's, like, important in some way, right? Like, this is not a travel cloak. This is a cloak that you wear as a mantle of power kind of vibe is what I get from that. Like, the cloak helps, like, make her wizardly and, like, sort of magical and sorceress, but it also, like, gives her a sense of stateliness, a sense of command, a sense of, like, this is someone who's in charge of some shit. Um, which, like, again, being Hecate, of course she is. Then there's Moros. I've seen people thirsting for this boy quite a bit already, and I can see why. So, I don't know that much ancient mythology off the top of my head. Uh, Greek mythology, anyway. I'm, I'm more well-versed in Norse mythology. Moros, as I understand it, is like a god of doom? Like, like not in the sense of like he causes doom, but like when some bad, inevitable thing is going to happen, like when some, some terrible doom is creeping closer, he's going to be there, and he's just going to be like there watching that thing happen. And he's not like it's not that he causes doom. It's not that he's like someone who goes and dooms people necessarily. But he's someone whose job it is to observe doom, like to to see to it that doom that is supposed to happen happens. That's my understanding of him, um, anyway. Which might be wrong. Like mythology nerds can correct me in the comments. Um, and he's sort of a classic hot character, Hades Hades character design, right? Like with lots of showing, lots of skin little bit of thigh action going on. He has got that immaculately sculpted face with, like, the high cheekbones and everything and, like, the highlight on the lips. Um, and then there's the antlers. Like, I think a lot of the thirst I've seen for this boy, I think a lot of it is just because of the antlers. And, like, one of the things I really like is the way that the hair interacts with the antlers because on the one hand, it's very silly, right? On the one hand, that's dumb. <laughs> Like, draping your hair over your antlers like that, like you're parting a curtain or something. That's slightly silly. Like, 
you can't move, Kit. Like, if he moves his head rapidly, even one time, it's going to either slide off or, like, fly straight in his face. On the one hand, theoretically, it's very silly. On the other hand, it's also such a stately, such a specific, such a curated thing, such a posed thing, such a such an affected thing that it has like this kind of peculiarly beautiful grace to it the way that it's put together like this is something that like that this is poised this is posed like this is not his hair just naturally did that this is a little theatrical in the way that it looks which like gives him a certain personality vibe right in part like when you look at the posture as well Again, on the assumption that I'm right about him, and Moros is like a, an observer of Doom, but not like a chaotic agent of chaos and destruction and Doom himself, this like very upright, very chest forward, arms back, hands behind his back, like the hands are the things with which we act, right? So his hands are behind his back, which signals a passivity, right? Like an, a, 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 an intention not to take action. Um... And, like, this very sort of upright, leaned back pose, like this very stately posture. The hair there is like, that only works if he's standing still. Statue still. That only works if he's not moving, if, if he's not doing stuff. So, it, it like, it sort of, for me, it emphasizes that sense of, like, a silent watcher. Of someone who's just standing there, seeing things happen as they do. Like a, a human statue, almost, in a sense. Um, and there is something quite beautiful about that. There's something quite attractive about that. Like, something that is so delicately postured like an artwork. Um, so I can see where the thirst is coming from. Now, the antlers are also interesting, because I don't know if... I don't know if they're, like, attached to this headband thing that he wears, or if they grow right out of his head. Given that he's a god, I would imagine that they grow right out of his head. But antlers like this, like, especially jagged antlers like this, like, really sort of jagged, sharp antlers like this... They also imply an animal nature, right? Like, this is a character who has an animal trait on his body that implies a certain level of animal nature, um, which means that there might be some hidden passion in there. There might be some hidden ferocity in there, right? He's calm, he's steady, he's stately, he is he is uh, regal, right up until the moment when, like, he decides to go, and then all of a sudden, like, the beast comes out. That's sort of the implication of that sort of thing in character design. Um... Which, again, would go some way towards explaining why people are being a little bit feral for this boy. Because there is the implication, right, that there might be something quite passionate, quite wild, lurking on the inside. If only you can get make, make it come out of him, right? If only you can bring it out, like, maybe there's a passion there. Like, that's kind of what I'm getting from, from the antler. Um, I'm curious about his clothing style. Because it seems to be distinctly different from... Certainly from the gods of Olympus. Um, like, with these, like, sort of colored tassel things around his thing. This neck, shoulder thing, brace, whatever the heck you call one of these. Um, and, like, the colors also. That's the interesting thing about him is, like, mostly Moros here is very drab, right? Like, for the most part, he looks very drab with his gray skin and his white hair and, like, this, like, like pale brown... Um, well, not pale, but like like sort of uh, desaturated brown antlers, and there's not a lot of bright color on him. But when you look closer, there is a lot of color on him. Like the the bright pink of the eyes and the skulls here, the little blue, orange, red decorations. Like the same thing on like the the sashes that he's wearing, um, and on his tattoos. Right, like there is. On this, again, this thing, on the surface, he seems drab, he seems silent, he seems quiet, he seems retiring, he seems dispassionate. But then, there is color there, right? Like, there is something there. I don't... Are these tattoos, by the way? Because Hephaestus, who we'll look at later, also has these. But they seem to be more like he's wearing some kind of sleeve on his arm. Um, and there is, like, a clear boundary. I don't know if these are supposed to be cloth or whether they're supposed to be, like, actual tattoos. But whatever they are, there's color there is the point I'm trying to get at. Like, there's color if you look closer at him. Um, he is actually kind of colorful in his wardrobe, which is interesting because that contrast, like, the initial impression I get on him immediately is, oh, this guy's drab, right? Like, this guy doesn't have a lot of color. But no, there is actually a bunch of stuff there. Um, which, again, I wonder if that hints at the idea of 
a placid exterior, but something of a passionate interior there after all. Um, and also, like, again, with the shoulder pieces that he's wearing, like, these sharp... They look like beetle horns almost to me, which, again, like, is this connection to nature. Um... Which, again, sort of implies a capacity for aggression, um, a capacity for danger, that sort of, like, is is contradicted by his sword, which is, like, this weird weapon, but very long and slender and very elegant. Like, it's a rapier, almost, right? Like, this looks like the weapon of someone who's, like, carefully engaging their foes, um, tactically and precisely. So I wonder about that. Like, I wonder about what, what kind of character he's going to be, ultimately. Then we have Apollo. Ah, god of prophecy, god of poetry, I think, or certainly seem to be playing the lyre a lot, and a sun god to boot. Um, and, like, the sun god thing is the most obvious first impression of him, right? Like, that's the immediate reaction to Apollo, is like, oh yeah, golden breastplate with, like, all of these, like, beams of light coming from this central sun motif on the thing, and, like, the bright, like, the bright, powerful flaming red, the fire of the sun, the heat of the sun, and then, like, the gold with the shine and the rays of the whole thing. Yeah, no, that's a sun god. <laughs> that is 100 million percent an, a, a, an Olympian sun god in the character design right there. Like, no objection to that whatsoever. Like, message received, I understand who this guy is um, in his mythological role. I like the lyre bow. It's not the first time I've seen one. Like, it's... it's do, do bards in Final Fantasy XIV have that as well? I can't remember. Um... But it's like it's it's an always useful care like design thing like to have the character be capable of both violence and music and poetry. It's like oh yeah, he's got a a bow that he can use to kill people with, but also it doubles as an instrument. Clever little thing. Now one thing I quite like about Apollo is his hair, um, because of the way that it's curling around. Like to me, this sort of looks like you know on the sun um, with like not. Like, not, it doesn't look like rays of sunshine, because they tend to, like, be... Like, they look like this. They are straight, like, rays that beam out from the central. But it's the, um, the, um, the, um, the, the plasma arcs, the things that... You know, the corona and on the surface of the sun that sort of... Uh, prominences. They look like prominences a little bit. Like, the way they curl around in these, like, erratic patterns. Sort of, to me, reminds me a little bit of, like, those chaotic prominences that you'll see bursting out from the surface of the sun um, in, like, solar photography. Uh, so I quite like that as an aspect, like, and it also gives him a little bit of a wild edge, right? A little bit of, a little bit of, a little bit of erraticness, a little bit of, of, of impishness, right? Like where the rest of him, his outfit is so composed, right? So well posed. Like this is just the, the, the martial outfit of a sun god who's ready to go to war, which is another aspect of Hades too, is that the gods here are at war. And we'll talk about that when we compare Hades one to Hades two gods, um, that they are at war. And that's like very much part of their character design. Like, this is, like, this is so well-posed and composed and so dignified. And then there's his hair, which is a fucking mess, right? Boy rolled out of bed, didn't comb that shit even one time. Um, and that gives him sli a slightly sort of, a slightly roguish edge. Like, a, a little bit of a messy feeling to him. Like, like this boy, he's like, yeah, he's the sun god, he's well-composed. And also, maybe there's a little bit more to it. Maybe there's a little bit of, of, of mischievousness to him, which is aided by the expression, right? Like, because these are static images that are going to be shown of the gods, um, like, for, for the vast majority of their dialogue, this is going to be, like, the key art that tells you who they are as people. So the fact that he has that smirk on his face, that confident little ha <laughs> on his lips, that tells you something about his attitude, right? Like, that Apollo is a little bit of a trickster god, which I think is also true of him in mythology. Um... And, like, the gold and the red, especially, like, with his darker color skin, uh, color skin, his darker color, colored skin, um, like, that pops brilliantly. Like, that bright red and that bright gold against, like, the, against the darker skin tone, that's, like, ooh, that's, that shit shines, that shit shows up. Um, which is one thing people were shitty about Hades 1, like, because of culture war bullshit, about the gods in Hades 1, some of them being people of color, which is, like... If you know anything about ancient Greece, if you know anything about geography, like if you look at where ancient, where Greece is on a fucking map, um, that's laughable. That's very, very, very silly. Um, this idea that <clears throat> that Greece was full of only white people or white people at all. Um, like, no, no, yeah, there are white people in Greece, but like, it's no, like Greece is on the Mediterranean. It, the Greek empire, the various empires of, of like Greece, like 
stretched from Macedonia like into India. Like the Vikings, there were there were people of color in Scandinavia. The Vikings ranged all the way to fucking Constantinople. Did you think that people didn't go back the other way? And like so going people of color coming from North Africa to Greece or even from like deeper parts in Africa or from the Middle East or from fucking India. It's like, no, that happened. That absolutely happened. We have historical record of that happening. So the idea that their gods would only be light-skinned, bright, like, is nonsense. It's ahistorical and it's racist. Um, and it's stupid. So if, you make, if you're making that argument, you're a dipshit. And I'm going to tell you so to your face. Moving on to Nemesis. Hmm. Who, uh, who... Mm. <laughs> who was made for me, I think. <laughs> A little bit. Um, cause damn, fucking hell. And one thing I want to, uh, I do want to point out, um, you look at... Melano, right? Like, Melano is also, she has muscle on her, right? Like, this is this is a body that's meant for athleticism, right? Like, she has muscle on her, but she's not curvy at all. Like, she's very flat, um, in the, like, like very skinny, very flat in the way that she's put together. Not much thigh action on her, not much of an ass, not much of, like, not much of hips on her. There, there she has the hourglass shape a little bit, but for the most part, she's not that much that. Nemesis, I want to point out, has, like, cake. <laughs> <laughs> like girl has girl has shape uh she has some filling um like i don't know 100 like i do love an hourglass shape like this like i mm, it's made for me it, it it appeals directly to me i do feel like when you look at actual strong women like women women who like actual practice um like uh, feats of strength and participate in strongman competitions they don't tend to have the snatched waist Right, like they, it, it depends on the person. There's a great variety of body types that are possible, but they don't tend to have like the thin waist and then like the big, like the big chunky back kind of thing with the with like the with like the wide hips. They tend to have very very thick, large, powerful cores um, because those core muscles are a core like are are important to basically any kind of like lifting, any kind of like like wrestling, any kind of like strenuous, powerful, prolonged physical activity where you have to engage the whole body, you need a very big, th strong, thick core to sort of support that. Um, so they don't tend to have those snatched waists. So I'm, I'm, I feel a little bit like from a character design perspective, it might have made more sense to give Nemesis a thicker core, not to make her any less muscular, but to give her a thicker core rather than sort of going for the very sort of like the very femme snatched waist thing and i don't know the character design considerations internally um for her like because it is a thing of like if you did that non-zero chance that a lot of players would just simply confuse her with a man like would simply refuse to see her as feminine if she didn't have that um that's a thing that happens unfortunately um is that if a character isn't performing femininity 100 percent uh like or, like if if it depends. Like, there's a lot of fat phobia around it, like, where fat people especially are less likely to be seen as especially feminine, um, like, fat women, which is uh, fucking annoying. Um, but, like, it might be the case that they gave her, like, this very pronounced hourglass shape with, like, the wide hips to really emphasize that, like, stereotypically feminine body shape to make sure that people would read her character design as femme, as female. Um, that's possible, and that annoys me. But it is one of those things you make, like, those considerations you make as a character designer is, like, is the audience going to understand, um, like, what uh, what I'm trying to say with this character design? I do feel like, like, I have a, I have a sense as a character, from a character design perspective, that making her thicker would make more sense with what she is, which is, like, a warrior, right? Like, th this is the other thing about Nemesis. You see her and it's like, oh, yeah, warrior, fighter. She's, she's, she's battle mommy, right? Like, she's, she's all about getting into a fight and killing some motherfuckers. And that comes across in every part of her character design. Um, like, even her hair, which I quite like, is that she has, like, this very long hair, right? And it it's bound up, but it's very messy also, right? Like, this is not a particularly refined, elegant haircut. This is, oh, I need to kill someone? Like, quickly wrap the hair up in a bun, tie it around, and then there's, like, a bunch of bangs and shit that hang out. Like, the thing doesn't matter. It's not too much in the way. Let's get the fight. Like, that's the vibe I get from her hairstyle here, is, like, this is something that you, like, sort of quickly tie up on the back of your head um, when it's time to crack some fucking skulls together. 
and I quite like that. Like, it has a wildness to it, right? It has a messiness to it that I think comports really well with the idea of her as, like, as this powerful, dangerous, vicious fighter character. Because Nemesis, of course, is Nemesis. She is, she is the, like, uh, the culmination of hubris, right? Like, she is the thing that delivers consequences to you um, when... <laughs> when you have gone a little bit too far. She is the consequences right there. I note that she has the uh, belt of Hecate. Like, same kind of sigil and, sim and symbolism, which connects her very explicitly to Hecate. Again, I don't know the mythology enough to know what that is referencing um, in terms of uh, their mythological relationship, but it's interesting to see that there is this connection that she seems to be in service in part to Hecate, and then also there's the Hades sigil. Um, so she's in, in, in service to Hades as well. Um, that is interesting and that's curious. I like the way that she is made sexy without without the more ridiculous kinds of sexualization, right? She's not a Franz Fazetta sort of um, uh, chainmail bikini Valkyrie, right? Like they, they haven't gone that direction with her. But also, it's not like she's, she's like desexualized either like like the draping of this over her thighs with like the thigh high leggings that she's got there with that little bit of like that little bit of pudge where they sort of compress down like that's at least to me that is a very sexy thing right like it's not and it's not obvious loud sexualization in the way that it would be if she was wearing a chainmail bikini but it's there right like there's this no no this this lady is hot you're supposed to understand her as hot you're supposed to understand her as very attractive and sexy and i quite like that like i quite like that they resisted the the temptation to maybe like fully make her just like this sparse stark nothing um in like in terms of in terms of attraction which is one of the things about hades right like I have a little bit of two minds about it. Like, on the one hand, there are definitely times in Hades where I feel like their commitment to making all of the gods hot all the time and all of the characters hot, it does undercut certain things occasionally. Like, it does, pre it does preclude opportunities for more interesting character design. I think especially of Dionysus from the first game, who, like who, like all of the other gods, has the gym shredded body with, like, the swole muscles and all of that, which is, like, that's fine. Like, he's supposed to be hot. He's supposed to be sexy. But the other thing is, like, also, he's the god of indulgence and, like, excess and partying and drinking and, like, shit. Like, wouldn't it make a little more sense to give him a little bit of a dad bod? Like, not, not this, like, various different ways you can do that, but, like, he doesn't seem to me like a guy who gets up at 6 a.m. to go to the gym to hit all of his CrossFit reps and, like, really carefully watches what he eats and, like, portion controls and shit like that. That doesn't really seem like Dionysus to me. He seems like someone who would have a more casual relationship with all of those things. Whereas someone like Nemesis, who's like, my whole thing is I kill motherfuckers, um, I deliver the consequences, this is what I am for. That makes sense for her, right? Like, that she would be someone who's, like, relentlessly martially training her body to be, like, this perfect instrument of destruction. Like, Ugh. that makes perfect sense for her that she would be jacked in this way. Whereas for Dionysus, I feel like the, the sort of the presumption that, well, hot means they go to the gym all the time is kind of reductive and, and closed out some more interesting options for his character design. Um... So, like, on the one hand, I feel like sometimes Hades loses out on other opportunities by being so committed to making everyone hot all of the time. But also, I feel like with Nemesis, if she wasn't a little bit hot, like, if there wasn't a little bit of a hint of of, of the sexy sexualization about her, I think she would lose something. I think this particular character design would lose a little bit of that. Because, like, sex, uh, sexualization and, and being sexy and being hot, those things are also connected to passion. Those are things are also connected to, like, pleasure, to, to hedonism, to a certain sense of, of, of um, free-spiritedness, right? Like, or, or a dedication to, to joy or to the, to the pleasures of flesh and blood. There's something about that that I feel like meshes... With Nemesis, like, obviously, these are all initial reactions. Maybe once we know something about her personality, once I've played the game, once I've seen who she is as a character, maybe I'll feel differently about it. But as the character design stands, that little bit, like, where it's just a bit, like, it's not a lot. And that's the same thing with the snatched waist, right? Like, the snatched waist gives her the wide hips and, like, the cake. And, like, 
I think the sexualization fits her. Like, I think it works for her. And that might partly just be my bias talking because this is very much pitched at me. Um, but I think so. Again, once I have a, a broader critical perspective on who this character is, maybe I'll feel differently. But otherwise, yeah, no, like, poof. Hello, Nemesis. Also, I noticed that she's wearing the crescent moon on her head. Um, so that she also has these connections with these night gods. I also like that she has painted nails and that she has lipstick. Again, this thing of like, sort of depending on how you read her, right? Like, it might make more sense for her to be more sparse, to be more Spartan, to be less femme, to be less explicitly gendered in that way, like with, with like makeup, with, um, with like the the body shape, maybe it makes sense for her character to be less gendered. Maybe that's a critique I'll have of her character once I play the game. Without that, though, I like that. I like that she has both like the brutality and the clear viciousness of a warrior, and also, yeah, she likes to paint her nails. She likes to wear lipstick. She like she likes to she likes to do a little bit of, of self decoration like that. Same thing with the earrings, right? Um, I do like that because that's also a thing about warriors. Is like. Historically, warrior warriors did like to decorate themselves. Like, well, depending on the time period and exactly who was going. But like, when you think about like, um, like chivalric knights, for example, those motherfuckers decorated themselves to shit, right? Like, all the fucking time. You think about like um, muscle armor, like historical armor that was sort of like uh, created in the image of like a muscled, powerful god, which was like like. Self-decoration has always been a part of warrior culture in various places. The Vikings did a lot. The Japanese samurai, holy fuck, those guys like to decorate themselves. Um, again, depending on time period and history. Uh, um, it's like, I like that there's a sense of decoration there also. That there's a sense of, like, of presentation. Um, I think that could definitely work with a character like that. But I guess we'll see. Then we have, uh, what was her name? Dora, who's a shade, a spirit that just kind of hangs around. From the clips I saw on the technical test, she's like a shade who's learning to haunt. Like, she, who's, she's learning to be a haunting ghost who haunts people. And so she'll, like, put on this scary voice and like, Oh, who dares enter my spiritual domain? Hey, did I do a good job? Did I do a good job of being scary? That seems to be her personality. I just like her because she's such a fucking gremlin. <laughs> like, yeah, no, she looks fun. She just looks like a fun character to interact with. Um, but beyond that, I don't have much reaction to her. Then there's Odysseus. Oh, you little shithead. You little motherfucker. You little bastard. You premier scumbag of Greek mythology. Well, yeah, Greek mythology, I guess. Of, of the Homeric um, Odyssey. Oh, you little shithead. Oh, you little bastard. How I hate you. I, I hate Odysseus. Brackets affectionate. Right? He's a shithead. He's a bastard. He's a scumbag. He's a trickster, he's a coward, he's a liar, he's a thief, and he's a hero, right? Like, he, he's that classic, he's the classic of the classic sort of ancient uh, the Greek heroes in that he's not a hero in the modern sense of the word, he's a hero in the sense of we tell stories about this guy because he just got up to so much cool fucking shit. Um, and I kind of like the character design that they've gone for here. Um, first of all, because he doesn't look divine, right? Like, there's something about the way that he's designed, especially his armor design, um, which is like this, this like, leather jerkin with these metal rock stone plates, perhaps even sort of, bolt, uh, like, stitch onto them. It's very sort of rugged. It's a lot, it's a lot less, um, sort of extravagant looking than, than, like, the outfit of, like, compare that with someone like Apollo, the fabrics and, and like, the shit that he's got on. Odysseus looks much more sort of utilitarian in his outfit. I like the mixing of fabrics as well. I really like that he has like this patterned fabric on like his cloak and then a different patterned fabric for like a scarf around his thing. Um, and then a different patterned fabric for like the rest of his tunic and around his waist. Like all these different patterns on him. I like that because that feels more grounded. That feels kind of like uh, more down to her, like a guy who's like, oh, I bought this at a market in like Persia when I was there on an adventure. And this one I got when I was uh, like running away from uh, Cersei without being transformed into a pig. I stole her tablecloth and now I use it as like, it has that sense of like stuff being picked up from different places and just sort of mashed together to make an outfit. I quite like that. Um, I also like the, the many different patterns that are on it because like that again, to me, at least, that sort of implies, like, it almost looks like camo, right, a little bit. Like, it, it looks like these many different patterns that look uh, incongruous with each other sort of sells the idea of someone who's a little bit of a trickster, who's a little bit of a a little bit of a scoundrel, right? Like, who ha a, a guy of many colors, a guy of many patterns, a leopard who changes his spots a lot, right? Uh, 
I like the maps that he's like got with him, like all of this information, like the little, um, like again, also because he's a sailor, he's a journeyer, he's someone who's traveled across the world, so he has the, the <laughs> I'm not sure that they, that they are entirely historically accurate, but he seems to have, um, a looking glass as well, which, you know, <laughs> uh, looking glass, is that what they're called? He got, it's not a binocular. Because a binocular is two when there's the double one, so it's I guess it's just an ocular. <laughs> um, whatever the fuck you call the spyglass, whatever. Um, I like that. Like it, he seems somewhat more rustic and down to earth, earth and practical than the gods. I like that he's balancing a knife on his finger, like this balancing on a knife's edge kind of thing, because that's very much Odysseus's thing as well. Like he he gets away by the skin of his teeth a lot, right? He gets away. Um, at, at like the point of a thing. It, it's also playful. It's also a little irreverent. It's also a little like, oh, he can do some juggling tricks with this thing. It's also a little bit fun, right? Cheerful, much like his expression. And I like the five o'clock stubble that he's got on his face, right? He's not clean shaven. He's not like, again, much like the gods, like this thing of like, he's not clean, right? Like he's not perfectly made up. He's not perfectly shaven. He's not immaculate. This is a guy who's rough around the edges and who has some who has some tricks up his sleeve, is the vibe I get from him immediately. And again, the hair helps to sell that. It's a little bit disheveled. It's a little bit out of sorts. It's like romantically swept aside, just out of his eyes kind of vibe. Um, which like really does give him that like, that that adventuring scoundrel vibe to him, which he wouldn't have if he had like a close cut, like a marine crop <laughs> sort of haircut, right? Um, so yeah, Odysseus, I am in I'm excited to interact with this son of a bitch. Then there's Hephaestus. Fuck yeah, Hephaestus? Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah, that rules. That rules so fucking hard. Um so Hephaestus in the mythology was deformed from birth, I think was the story. He was he it was like born with terrible birth defects. He was ugly, right? And so the gods threw him off of Mount Olympus. I don't remember which god exactly. It could have been any of them. They're all kind of bastards. Um and crashing down to earth, like that broke his leg, right? Like that damaged him for life so he would always be like uh like um crippled. He would always be disabled. He would always be like having trouble walking on one leg, I think was part of his story. The way that they've just like, well, sh fine. He's the god of smith smithing and of forges. He's the god of making and creation. So he made himself a fucking wheelchair and the most badass, gorgeous looking prosthetic you've ever seen in your life. Like, fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah, that rules. That is a fucking awesome way to do that. That's a fucking awesome way to incorporate like that part of the mythology, that rather ugly part of the mythology and then make it like, no, no. He did that to him, like, he gave himself these tools, right? Like, he made these things for himself, where, like, of a character who's, who's like, visibly disabled, but who's not, like, with the disability is not, like, this thing that's, like, like, chronically a disempowerment, right? Like, but it's a thing that they can use to express themselves and, and like, and, like, show their power, show their agency, like, through having a disability and the ways that they deal with it. I think that's fucking cool. I think that fucking rules. Also, People have been correctly identifying that, uh, like, you you would not believe how many people I've seen thirsting for Hephaestus. And I think that's very nice, because that's yet another one of those things that counter-argues the incel dipshits who think that, like, you have to be an alpha with, like, a perfect skull ratio, and, like, oh, 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 women only go for chads. Oh, like, it, it's yet another one of the many, 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 many facets of reality and truth that simply disprove... Um, that old piece of bullshit. Because Hephaestus is undeniably hot, right? Not my type, but, like, look at him. Look at this motherfucking bear daddy, right? You would not believe the number of gay guys who would go absolutely fucking feral for Hephaestus. You would not believe the number of women who want this exact kind of soft, sweet, like, with the gentle soft eyes and the big beard that he clearly cares for very carefully. Again, this thing about like the hair informing the character. This hair is cared for. Like this is a guy who takes care of his appearance, who like decorates himself with, again, I'm not sure if this is a sleeve. I think, I think this is a sleeve, but like who decorates himself, who presents himself beautifully, who creates himself. All of these things are incredibly fucking attractive, not just to women, but to a lot of people. And I, I'm, I really like that. That's the thing about like, 
this 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 thing about like the Hades gods being hot in Hades one, sometimes it felt like that meant a very limited vision of what attractiveness could be, of what hotness could be, of what a beautiful person could be. And I'm glad to see that they have expanded that in Hades too, where they are taking account of like more different kinds of bodies, more different kinds of people, more different kinds of attractiveness and attraction, right? Rather than sort of constantly hewing to the one beauty ideal saying, hey, there are many beauty ideals and we can have more than one of them in this game shown and represented. So I like Hephaestus a lot, like just if nothing else for being something new, like a new kind of beauty in a series that like, where the character designs are so often about beauty, right? Like where the character designs are so often about various beauty ideals, um, that Hephaestus is like, brings in another vision of that, like adds something more to the picture. I quite like that. And again, also like just from a storytelling perspective, the, the fucking, like the aesthetic cohesion, right? Like between the wheelchair with the, with like the signifiers and the, and the symbology and the color scheme and like the tattoo sleeve, whatever the fuck the thing is, like or the sleeve that he wears, whatever it is. Um, and then with the designs on like his prosthetic, the way that all of those things cohere and like fit together so perfectly is like, again, good storytelling that this is a man like he made all of this for himself right like this is all expressions of him right um which is I, it's just cool like it's a fucking cool character design i like it a lot i think it's really good i think it's really nice and like not just for like that's the accusation you always get is like oh it's a woke pandering blah, 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 blah. like that shit and it's not just because of that, it's because it's a character design that tells a good story, that engages with the premise of like this mythological character and has a distinct and interesting take on what he is and what he looks like and like how he creates himself, right? Um, that's why it's good. Not that there aren't criticisms of it. Like again, Hephaestus specifically in the mythology, as I recall it, again, I'm not an expert on it. As I recall the mythology, Hephaestus was specifically, like, ugly, like, deformed in a way that's, like, not aesthetically attractive, that doesn't live up to any kind of beauty ideal. That's why the gods were assholes to him all the time. That's why his wife kept cheating on him, and that was supposed to be kind of funny, I guess. Um, and, like, you can sort of make the criticism that, like, even though they include a more like a, a, a body type that's underrepresented, even though they include fatness, even though they include like a disability um, as part of their visions of beauty, they still do fall back on like certain signifiers of beauty. Like for example, the fact that he has a perfectly symmetrical face, which is like, yeah, like where you could broaden the representation, you could broaden the diversity by like having him actually have some kind of congenital disability that is often conceptualized in mainstream culture as ugly, right? Like, like, um, like a facial deformity or something like that. And then like try and, and like present that in a way where the beauty of it becomes obvious. Like where you, where you find and you see beauty in it, that might've been more creatively interesting. And that's also a lot more challenging. That's more difficult to do. And that like, it requires a lot of care to do that in a way that isn't like objectifying or that isn't insulting to the people that you're depicting. But that would be a criticism that you might have of like, not just Hephaestus, but Hades character design as a whole is that like, yeah, they do branch out, like, they do do different kinds of bodies and stuff. Like, I'm also very glad that we have, um, like, Demeter being an old woman being visibly shown in the game as, like, as, like, sort of powerful and cool and regal. But you could definitely make the criticism that, like, they are, there are clearly spaces that they don't go to in their representations and, like, that that weakens this thing as a whole. I'm not really... I don't want to make that criticism very much, though. Like, I don't think necessarily... That that's the case, I'm very happy that Hephaestus is here and that he's presented like unambiguously as hot as fucking hell. Not to everyone, like lots of people just have an irrational like brain meltdown when they see a person who is anything less than like 1% body, anything more than 1% body fat. Some people go weird for that. Some people are freaks. Um, but that there is a vision of beauty just beyond thin and gym shredded, right? So, moving on to Selene, a character who, again, because of the moon thing, because of that moon sigil that's on a bunch of other characters, clearly is going to be quite important um, to the narrative. 
So she is, as I understand it, the goddess of the moon. I don't know in Greek mythology if she literally is supposed to be the moon. Um, or if she's just like a representation of it. Because like, Apollo isn't the sun. Right. Right. He, he drives the chariot that pulls the sun across the sky, I think, is the way that that goes. Um, so Selene, I guess, would be something similar in that she's connected to the moon, but she's not the moon itself. Mythology nerds, once again, correct me in the comments. Um, and I like the Pegasus. I quite like that she's like, she has a mount specifically um, that sort of carries her around. That's like, in terms of like, because again, Selene moon being the moon clearly is supposed to be incredibly powerful, like incredibly significant to a lot of these other characters who wear moon sigils on themselves, right? So the like having her presenting her as like riding atop a horse, like like striding out of the clouds on like the back of this flying winged horse, is like yeah, that like that's a good way to present her as someone who's like powerful, regal, um who's like a sort of a, a being of cosmic significance. Um that's just cool. Like that just makes her strong. That makes her like that makes her look significant. I like I like the high cheekbones. I like the sort of slightly gaunt thing that she's got going on there that like with like those bright glowing eyes. I like that. Like, because Moonlight is often, like, pale, silvery. It's a little bit... It's a little bit thin. It's a little bit sort of silvery, wispy. It doesn't feel substantial in the same way that Sunlight does. So I like the sort of the idea of, of, of Celine being a little bit, like, on the... on the skinnier side. I think, in fact, like, they might have leaned into that harder if they wanted to. Um, again, this thing about, like, you could explore even more things in the body types of these characters, you could make her even thinner. Like, you could make her even, like, more slim or or insubstantial, like, to sort of mimic the idea of, of Moonlight. Uh, she just kind of looks cool. Like, I'm just... I'm sitting here trying to think of something to react to it, but she just looks fucking gorgeous, man. Like, she looks like a fucking god. Have you ever seen a character who looks more like a fucking god in your life? Like, with the crown, with the moon behind her, like, this divine circle thing and like this half moon crescent headpiece thing with all the decorations on it and I note again that um, that rope that multicolored rope um, that Hecate has on her hat and that Melano has around her leg um, and the tassels as well that's also a thing that she shares with Melano and, and Hecate just like this is this is just the most god as god I think I have seen in a long ass fucking time. The way that like her crown, like this silver, this whatever this is, this metal crown that holds the moon, the way that it just sort of melts into this long trailing carpet of hair that sort of falls down around her shoulders like clouds, right? Again, associating with her with the sky. absolutely fucking gorgeous. Like, just the most godlike motherfucking god. And everything flows with her, by the way, also. Like, like, like the dress that flows down into, like, these flowing, luscious Pegasus wings. Like, the Pegasus mane is flowing. The Pegasus tail, the hair. It all has this sense of, like, billowing, of, of like, unfolding before your eyes. That makes her, like, again, gives her that size, that imposing presence that a goddess probably should have. She's fucking gorgeous, man. I don't I don't know that I have a lot of analysis to add here because like, yeah, she's the moon goddess. She has moon sigils and stars and moon sigils and moon shapes and crescent shapes and all over her because that she's the goddess of the moon. So all of the moon things are moon about her moon. And she's silver and she's like, has the blue, teal, white tones and like grays that sort of like give this melting silvery feeling to her it's like yeah it's all there i don't i don't really know if i have a criticism really like i said this thing about you could make her even thinner and more insubstantial but you don't need to she looks like the goddess of the moon she looks like the most fucking goddess of the moon i think you can possibly fucking make her look 
she's fucking gorgeous, man. It's a gorgeous piece of artwork. It's a gorgeous character design, too. Like, it's the specificity of the design, right? Like, it's the... This is such a stupid, implausible... Like, who would ever wear this thing as a helmet as a, on their head, like a thing, except as this act of ceremony, right? Like, this, this, this act of, like, divine construction with, like, these divine spheres, these circles within circles, wheels within wheels, like, the, the wheeling of the cosmic, except as a signifier of that, of that, like, kind of divine power and presence, why would anyone wear something like this? Ooh, I have to skip that, because if there's a song playing, I'm going to sing along. Um, yeah, no, just, she looks divine. She just looks divine. That's great. Then we have Arachnia. Um, and I'm really, I'm really, oh, Ara uh, Arachne, rather, uh, not Arachnea. Um, I'm really tickled by her. Look how fucking cute she is. That's fucking adorable. Um, so Arachne, as I recall, was a spinner, a spinstress, a little, a, a, someone who deals with spinning cloth and stuff, who, depending on this version of the story, either got so good at spinning that she thought herself better than one of the gods. I can't remember which god. Was it Hera? No. Athena? Probably Athena. Athena's gonna get pissed off about these things. Um, where she thought herself better than the gods, which was an act of hubris, and then, like, in... And then, again, depending on the version of the story, I think either she actually does beat a goddess in a spinning contest, like, does it better than her, and in punishment for her hubris, she's transformed into a spider. Like, to spin webs and threads forever. Um... Or else it's a thing of like, they just, oh, you think you're better than the gods? They, you get transformed into a spider. Or it's a thing of, she's just so fucking good. And everyone says, oh, Arachnia, she's better at spinning than insert goddess here. And then that goddess gets pissy and turns her into a spider. I can't remember exactly how the story goes. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's multiple different versions. But look how cute she fucking is. Look how fucking adorable she is. That's a cute little spider design, like with the extra eyes placed around the top of the head as like, yeah, they're extra eyes and they're supposed to be creepy, but here they look like a uh, like a tiara or a diadem or gems. They look like some kind of self-decoration that's quite pretty. Um, and she's mostly just designed to be cute, right? Like with the big round like baby eyes and like the, the little cutesy red lips and st stuff. But like the little the little pixie cut with like the, the frizzy hair and then the fact that she has woven all of these little arm warmers, like these little these little wristbands and stuff out of different color threads just to decorate herself with, is like, that's such a personable little thing. That's such a little that's such a little detail that gives her like character. Right? Like this thing of like, oh she decorates herself. She makes these little accessories for herself. That's gorgeous. That's very, very fun. That's cute. And I like that the thread is multicolored. And like having her posed in front of like a tapestry that she's clearly weaving is very good. And the detail of having her perched atop a blade of grass does so much for the scale, right? Like if you didn't have this detail of like she's sitting atop a blade of grass, she could be any fucking size, right? Like she's small in her artwork already, but it's also this thing of like, Oh, is this a man-sized spider? Is this like a huge spider? No, this is a tiny spider. This is an itty bitty little thing. This is a tiny little cute thing that's just so tiny and sitting on a blade of grass and spinning its little webs and stuff. That's adorable. I really like this character. Like instantly I am endeared to her. Instantly I think she's adorable. I want to protect her. What a sweet little creature. So, Seuss. Right, um, so I have the old artwork here, mostly by way of comparison, and one of the changes that has happened from Hades 1 to Hades 2 is the art style has gotten a lot less scrappy. Um, it's gotten a lot less scratchy, a lot less sketchy in the way that it puts the lines together. We'll see this especially with the, with the, with the last character I have in my slideshow here. Um, like, it's become a lot more refined, it's been cleaned up a lot, and it uses a lot fewer of like these hard, dark shadows that really, really characterize the artwork in Hades 1 is that you have these very harsh, very dark, like hard inked shadows on pretty much every character in, in the story. Now, they're still present. Like the hard, dark shadows are still there, but they have been reduced a lot. Like you can see Zeus has a lot fewer of them in his beard and in his hair, um, <clears throat> in like the clouds that surround him. They're just sort of a little bit more accent and the line art and the style in general has 
cleaned up some, I think. Like, it's it's a lot less scratchy. It's a lot less scrappy. Again, this is also early access artwork. They might be replacing some of this down the line, so I'm just commenting on what's there right now. Um, but we also definitely get to see, like, the change in circumstance for the gods, right? Like, that in Hades 1, the gods are just up on Olympus, kind of having their party time, uh, just chilling, hanging out, having a good time, uh, not worried about too much of anything. And in Hades 2, they are at war, right? And so Zeus definitely sort of represents that, going from wearing his, like, yellow toga loungewear thing to fully kitted out in, like, a breastplate and, like, king of the gods ready to do battle sort of vibe. I think he's maybe a little underdesigned in some ways. I feel like there's more you could do with Zeus as a god of thunder than just to have, like, lightning bolts on his cloth here. It's like, that seems a little... It seems like a god like Zeus, someone who's so full of himself, someone who's so self-regarding and so arrogant and so proud. It seems like he should maybe have more decoration. He should maybe have more stuff going on than just what's going on with him here. Um, he still has that Im imperious, imposing size, that grandness to him that comes courtesy of his cloud hair, right? Like this storm cloud that's rearing up from beneath him. Um, and transitioning into his hair. He still looks big. He still looks imposing and dangerous. And this is something that I felt about him in Hades 1 as well. I still do feel like as king of the gods, as like, as like, like, <laughs> as like king fuckboy of, of, of God Mountain, he should be a little bit more full of himself in terms of his character design. Because like, Nemesis... Look how much self-decoration Nemesis has with all these tassels, with all these color things, with all of this everything that she's got going on. And then you go to Zeus and it's like, you yeah, know, he's yellow. Uh, he's yellow, neon glow a little bit, some lightning bolts on the toe. It seems too little. Like, it seems like something more ought to happen here with the king of the gods to sort of display his his arrogance and his pride and his self-confidence. I also think this arm looks a little weird. Um, in the anat like that elbow doesn't look right to me, the way that that's put together. I feel like there's some muscle missing from it somewhere, um, which again, early access artwork. Who knows how much they're gonna change it um, for later? But yeah, he definitely looks more ready for war, more like he's about to, you know, command a bunch of gods to fight some titans or whatever. But he's lost a lot of his charm. Like I think there was a certain level of of sort of like. I mean, even in Hades 1, he wasn't that charming in his artwork, honestly. Maybe I'm just kind of remembering his voice performance, which, which was extremely charming. But here, I feel like this is a little bit underplayed. Like, I like the lightning bolt eyebrows, right? Like, I like the beard hair. I like, I really, in terms of this illustration, by the way, I really like how the lighting is handled on the cloud beard and the hair. Um, it looks so good. But I think he's underdecorated. I think there's a little too little going on here. I think there should be a little bit more something something going on with Zeus specifically. Again, also thinking back to his voice performance in Hades 1, like just the way that he was conceptualized. Oh, oh, oh I am the grand, I'm Zeus of the Olympus. Ha, ha, ha. I am very affable and jovial, but don't cross me. Right, like there, there should be a little bit more ostentatiousness about him, I feel. But yeah. Then we have Demeter. So in Hades 1, Demeter is the goddess of, well, she's the goddess of the seasons, right? But she's stuck in winter, and she has stayed in winter because Persephone is gone, and she's not really willing to accept that Persephone is gone, right? Like, so she has locked the world in, in, in eternal ice and winter, and you can very much see that in her character design, right? Like, she has these, um, like, these sheaths of grass, corn, whatever they are, like, um, that sort of sprout out of her hair, right? Like, sprout out of the braids on her shoulders. But they are all frozen, and she has these ice crystals all everywhere in her design. And her, this cloak, which is like this heavy sheath of just snow hanging down over her. And all of her tones are cold, and like, the, the cornucopia is full of ice and snow. And she holds, like, the ribbon of Persephone of her daughter in one hand, because she will never let go of that lost child, um, whom she has not been able to find. And in Hades 2, there's a thawing happening. All of a sudden, like, this is, this, like, it's more like autumn, really, right? Like, there seems to be a little bit of a thaw in the sense that, like, we're seeing her in her autumn phase, which, like, the turning of the seasons has started again is sort of what I'm getting from it, is that with 
Persephone reunited with Hades and like Zacharias' little plan to sort of to sort of fix it all coming off and, and hey, Persephone's plan to, to, to smooth things over coming off that Demeter has also started, started to slowly lighten up. Now, they're at war, so she's not going to be in her spring or summer phases just yet. She's still going to be using the bitter cold of winter. Um, but there is a thaw, right? Like, there is a visible, distinct thawing in her character design. Also a withering, but, you know, that's still movement. That's still progress in the seasons. So I like that a lot. I also like the armor that she wears um, because, again, it has a certain, a certain, what the fuck am I saying? Certain utilitarian vibe to it. Like this is not compare and contrast with Zeus, right? Big muscle armor with like lightning decorations on it, like the fucking the titties out and like shredded as fuck. Right? Oh, look how look how fucking strong my body is. And this is more like no, no. I want to stop a dagger, right? Like this is this is like plate mail over like. Uh, like a hardened leather queer ass thing on the, over the center, and then like a little bit of an armored skirt kind of thing. This feels a lot more like like where Zeus feels like the armor of like the the emperor, right? Like the grand leader who stands and gives all the speeches and shit like that. This feels like the armor of like a battlefield commander, right? Like this feels like the armor of someone who is down there actually fighting in the muck kind of vibe. Um, which again, like in terms of Demeter's personality in, in Hades one, she is someone who is decidedly more practical, decidedly more more hands on, and decidedly less po uh, like um, diplomatic and polite than Zeus is when she gets angry. Um, so yeah, I like that. I like that she again also has the sickle, the harvest tool, but she's wielding it as a weapon of war, as a weapon of death. And I like that the cornucopia is no longer frozen over. Right again, this this signifier of maybe the potential for thawing um, that I quite like. She also looks a little bit younger. Like here, she looks very like she looks like a matriarch. She looks like an old woman, right? Like, um, which is one thing I really liked about her presence in Hades One. She looks a little younger to me here. Like not much, not not a lot, but she seems a little bit more tight um, in her skin. Like a little bit more, like a, li a little bit less um, ancient. A little bit more hardened, a little bit more carved out of flint and steel. Um, which, again, they are at war. That's probably the significance of that. Um, but, like, with the hair all, like, again, this thing about this is the gods having party times on Olympus, having relax relaxation with her hair down. And then here, we're heading into battle. We're going to tie our hair up. And now she's also wearing, like, um, she had like this thing on her forehead before this ice crystal thing now she's wearing a crown right like which gives her this regal presence like this thing of like i am commanding shit over here i am the god of the seasons i move heaven and earth right it gives her an imperial like regal powerful feeling to her i've always really liked demeter as a character design like she's she's fucking cool man she really is Poseidon, the hap, like the if if Zeus is sort of the imperious, don't fucking cross me. But uh, as long as you are on my good side, ha ha ha! I am Zeus. I'm the like this is your fun uncle, right? Like where Zeus is like the 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 imposing patriarch, Poseidon is the fun uncle, like Zeus's fun brother, who's a little bit more lip, like who who like bring you a ke a keg of beer, right, for your for your 18th birthday, and tell you, hey, go crazy, kid, like like give you a bunch of money, like uh, slip you a condom on prom night, right? Like it's like, hey, just in case you need it, that that kind of uncle, right? Like a slightly bad influence, a little bit a little bit sketchy, but ultimately like the guy who like who's always fun to hang out with, kind of vibe. He's very much kept that um, in Hades too. Like the gods are here in war mode, but that hasn't really <laughs> hasn't really hasn't really affected Poseidon all that much. He's still essentially wearing the Hawaiian shirt um, of the gods' character designs, um, with like this little shell pattern thing, and like the the fishes and like the the iridescent scales on the thing of like he looks very cheerful. Like he looks very much like he's about to sing under the sea, um, or at least if you if you set up a, a karaoke machine, he would join in with a rendition of Under the Sea with like this very colorful weapon, especially like really sort of evoking, um, like that's a big change from the way his weapon look in, looked in Hades one is like, it has much more color to it, much more corals and like colorful tropical fish and shit like that. That is in his character design. I love the crown made of seahorses. I think that is such a cute little character design trait. 
I think that's fantastic. Like that's, yes, as a crown for like an ocean god, absolutely a crown made of seahorses. That fucking rules. Um, he's still the colorful one. He's still the fun one, right? Like he still looks like he's the, he's the one you sort of rather hang out with for an afternoon, right? Like, cause he'd take you to the arcade and give you like as many quarters as you want um, and get you both pizza on the way home. Like that's sort of still sort of the vibe of this guy, but also he would probably like, like, tell you about this really cool investment opportunity or try to get you uh, to, to like buy a, a timeshare or something at some point. That's the kind of uncle that he seems like. I think his artwork looks a little unfinished over on this side a little bit. So again, early access, who knows? Um, but I like the colorfulness. I like especially like the teals, the reds, the gold, like this, this great variety of color, especially as a contrast to his brother who was very monocolored, like, who was very much like, this is yellow on yellow with a little bit of blue and then some yellow and then a bunch more yellow and some neon green and yellow. Like, he's very sort of in one mode, which is that he's the god of thunder. Poseidon is the god of the sea, so there's all of this everything and, like, these little fishtail-like fringes around his, like, battle collar or whatever the hell this thing is. Yeah. He's still, he's still so fun. I still really like Poseidon as a character design. Now, Artemis, she already has the moon sigils that associate with Selene and the moon because she's the goddess of the hunt, right? And I think she's one of... Is she one of Selene's daughters? Is that the way it works? Something like that? I can't remember. Um, but she has changed quite a bit in Hades too, Like, to the point where I almost didn't recognize her um, as the same character at all. Like, a lot has really changed in the way that she's being presented, I feel. Um... And I am missing something about the old version of the character. Like, especially, like, her, her eye makeup. Like, these, like, this little, this little bullseye mark, like, this little crosshair over her eye. I thought was such a nice little detail to sort of show the, the idea of her being a hunter who always hits her mark. Um... I liked that she's, like, relatively unclothed, and she only wears, like, very basic, like, a sort of very basic tunic rag thing with, like, a fur lining kind of thing. I, I like this, the, the, the specific simplicity of that. She's gotten a little bit more complicated in Hades, too. Like, again, with the tassels, she has, again, the colored rope that seems to identify her as, like, associated with Selene, with Hecate, with, uh, with Melano, like, of that crowd. But also her outfit is a little bit more complicated now, like with the... Or did she wear the belt in Hades 1? No, like in Hades 1 she just had like this very simple belt that held her quiver on. And here she has like this thing and like her tunic has been split in two, like into this, like this top that's wrapped around her waist and then like this skirt down there. And I don't know, I feel this might just be biased towards the, f like, there's always a thing of, like, when something changes, you'll instantly go, oh, no, a change. I prefer the old thing because that's familiar to me, right? There's familiarity bias that might be speaking here. I don't 100% know. I do miss the simplicity of the old design a little bit. I miss the crosshair over her eye. <laughs> I thought that was a very good part of her character design. Um, I also like that she had, like, the fur collar kind of thing, but she also has this wild like, chunky, almost kind of matted haircut, like this big, chunky-ass braid of the hair on her head. Um, because, again, that had a certain sense of wildness to it. Where, like, here, her hair seems a lot more well-cared for and well-maintained, which was the thing of, like, I kind of liked it if her hair looked a little bit fucking messy, like she's been, like she's been crawling through mud and, like, running through the rain for two days, like, hunting down a specific piece of prey, and she's not someone who cares that much about, like, presenting herself and about being like 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 recently laundered and washed and like combing her hair and all that shit she just kind of ties it up and goes um i kind of liked that vibe of the old artemis artwork i think she's changed a bit here to seem also the old artemis was very kind of a little bit strange and standoffish like maybe a little, maybe a little bit autism coded in some ways like the way that she sort of seemed to have trouble with social cues and like niceties and rituals um, that she didn't quite understand the purpose of, and she spoke very bluntly, um, without a lot of, of, like, um, sort of, without ever speaking around things. Here, again, because this, the artwork is the one that's supposed to be communicating the whole of their character, because that's gonna be on screen every time they talk, with the smile, with the kind of confident, slightly DreamWorks face thing that she's got going on with the eyebrows, 
it feels a bit like a different character. And maybe that's because of the war. Like, maybe that's because during the war or like, something in the interim, she's kind of found her confidence or she's grown up a little bit or she's kind of, like, grown into a different phase of her life where she is a little bit more outgoing and confident and cheerful and, and whatever. That would be fine. Like, again, the context of who the character is in-game is going to be important to these fucking character designs. I do feel like she feels very different. Um... And, like, I would be curious to find out if she's, like, that's because there is an actual change in her personhood, in her personality. Because otherwise, I think the artwork is just presenting her as a very different character than who she was. Which, you know, uh, is a little bit, little bit of a pity, I feel, in some ways. Um, I like the bow, though. I like that the bow is simpler. Like, the old bow in Hades 1 was this quite elaborate piece with, like, these, like, these, like, um designs carved into it, like this this slightly elaborate shape. I like that the bow here is extremely simple. Like, just, like, almost like it's made of bone, right? Like, with these simple decorations on it, nothing extravagant, nothing superfluous. The same thing with her quiver. Like, the old quiver with the gold rim and, like, the sort of, like, the very fine-looking arrows, I like that this is simpler and this is rougher around the edges. Like, anything that sort of makes her rougher around the edges, more of, like, the huntress who just kind of hangs out in the wild and, like, doesn't really, like, socialize with the gods or hang out with the fancy folk. I like those details. I like those changes. I think those are good. So, yeah. Mixed feelings about Artemis. Um, mostly because I feel like the personality switch in her presentation is quite stark. But again... Maybe that'll be justified in the game. Who knows? Then there's Aphrodite, right? Like, if there ever was a character who, like, you'd be justified in sexualizing her, it's Aphrodite, right? Like, a character, like... And my only thing about her in Hades 1 is... This is my personal feeling. I personally feel that, like... Uh, an evening gown with, like, a deep cleavage that, like, hugs her figure, doesn't show skin necessarily, but just, like, sh shows you that there's a gorgeous body underneath there. I s tend to find that more sexy than just plain nudity. Like, uh, because, like, the implication, the flirtation of it, right? The invitation to imagine that comes from, like, a really elaborate, gorgeous gown or, like, like a really sexy piece of clothing. I think that's more alluring, I think that's more seductive than just nudity. They are doing something of that with Aphrodite, though, where they use especially her hair just to hide the naughty bits a little bit, to be a little coy, to be a little bit like, oops, you almost saw, but not quite, and like all of these little heart shapes that her hair makes. Like, Aphrodite is hot as fuck. Let's not, let's not beat around the bush on that one. It's just my personal feeling about like the way that like you get alluring and like very sexual and attractive. I think clothing is a part of that. And I think nudity is sort of skipping to the end of a seduction, which is when you get naked and vulnerable with each other, but the seduction itself is like, there's these layers of obf obfuscation. And the attractiveness is partly about unveiling and like parting those layers and seeing what's beneath. Um, like that, that was like the only thing I have in terms of like a criticism of Aphrodite in Hades 1. Hades 2 is like, she's still naked? But somehow, with the shield and, like, the eye makeup and just, like, the little bits of extra clothing that she's wearing, they're kind of getting the effect of the evening gown for me. Right? You know what I mean? Like, it's it's not an evening gown in the way that, that I would imagine it, but, like, just the fact that she's wearing something, like, some more things now, that she's just that little bit more covered up in some places with, like, these elaborate headgear and shit... I, she's so much fucking hotter now. <laughs> like, I don't know why. It's like, there's just something about her having that little bit of extra covering that sort of gives you that effect, right? I do, I do feel like her old hair was a lot more sort of wild and curly and almost like tentacles a little bit. Like, almost like she would come close to you and her hair would sort of wrap around your arm and like gently tug at you or like caress you with it. Like, that, that sort of had that vibe to it. Um... This hair is a little bit more calm. It's a little bit more chill. It seems a little bit more under control. And I, maybe you could sort of bring back a little bit more of that seductive curliness uh, that the old hair had. Maybe. But, like, for the most part, like... Yeah, no, she's so much fucking hotter now. <laughs> like, something about her just, like... 
just the addition of the shield and like these little armors on her arms and like the battle makeup over her eyes like this this like bat war paint thing that she's got going on that little bit of extra covering up shit like somehow that just like that just made her five times more alluring i don't know why 100 percent. i think it is the evening gown effect but still damn and i do love like aphrodite armored up for war it's like oh no yeah she'll wear some armor just not on her titties not over not over her pussy not anywhere like in the sexual bits because those stay out with aphrodite aphrodite don't put those away not for nothing not for no one i like that um as like an expression of, of like her power as a as a goddess of love that is that is that is pretty badass like that that is pretty cool it's not smart <laughs> i would wear armor over all of my sensitive bits um but it is the kind of thing that feels like it also feels very true to Aphrodite's character from Hades 1, is that she is someone who'd be like, well, no, I'm not going to get hit. No one's going to dare to strike me, right? Like, no one will dare, because I am the fucking queen of love, and no one raises a fist against me. Like, like that she would have that confidence, right? Like, that imperiousness to her is like, no, yeah, that does that does feel like her a lot. And also, like, just the way she handles the spear, right? Like, she's not holding it. She's not grasping onto it. She's caressing it. She's just gently running a finger down and just letting it rest against her hand ever so sweetly. And it has these long, delicate ribbons flowing from it. It's like, mm. okay, stop singing. I have trying very hard not to sing along. Like, fuck yeah. Like, that's, that's the way she would handle a weapon, I think. Absolutely. It's like, she looks like a battle queen. She looks like she could and would kill you. But also, if you play nice, she looks like she couldn't would be nice to you. Which, like, hmm. I don't know. Why did just a shield and some armor on her arms and the, th and the little thing on the thighs? The little bit of the thigh high, but then no cl- mm. Like, the thigh highs, but then nothing on the- th why is that so fucking hot? Like, because I was like, I was like, Hades one is like, oh no, she's gorgeous, she's beautiful. I don't find her necessarily that seductive, just in her character design, like more in her affect and her attitude. And then here, it's just like that little bit of thigh high. She has a shield now and some arm covering and the neck thing. And now all of a sudden, I'm sitting here going like, oh my god, Aphrodite, <laughs> hello. <laughs> I don't know, man. Character design is weird sometimes. Then there's Hypnos, precious baby boy Hypnos. Um, I always loved his big fucking comforter blanket cloak thing that he had in Hades 1. Like this, like he's ready to go to sleep anytime, anywhere. Like 100% with the sleep mask, with <laughs> his dopey little expression. Our boy is ready to nap. He is the nap master of Mount Olympus and of Hades. Like, like the, no one can match this boy for pure sleeping hours. Um, it was always adorable, like, his sleepy little eyes and, like, the bags under his eyes as though he's permanently has had too little sleep somehow. Um, cute and adorable. And in Hades 2, oh, thank lord, he finally gets to actually have his fucking nap. <laughs> just, just bundled up in his little sleeping bag with his hair all let down and, like, having grown much longer. Just having himself a quick, sweet little snooze. I'm not 100% sure about what the deal is with his snoozing, like, whether it's a thing of this is just something he does where he sleeps for a long time and can't wake up or if it's some kind of curse or if it's like whatever it is with him um the way that he's presented the way that he's sleeping it does seem a little like like this is not him sleeping out of pleasure but more like he's hibernating or he's been forced into sleep somehow like because it just it doesn't look like him sort of cheerfully lazing about being asleep having a nap like taking a chill time it feels more like he doesn't have a choice but to sleep, just in the way that it's presented. That's just me, though. I, I don't want to say no, but I do love that he sleeps on a bed of poppies. Um, I think those are poppies, right? Because poppies is, like, that's where you get opium from, um, and, like, opiates. Um, very much a drug that'll knock you the fuck out. <laughs> cute, cute little fella. With the much longer hair as well, which sort of indicates that there's a long time has passed. Well, it has. Like, a long time has passed since Hades 1 because, like, Melano was born and grew up. Um, 
but might also indicate that he has spent quite a long time asleep, right? That he's spent so long asleep that he's never had a haircut for, like, God knows how many years, which again sort of makes me wonder if this sleep is entirely voluntary on his part. And then there's Skelly. A character in Hades 2 is apparently called Skelemachius, and he's wearing a beard, uh, so he's probably a completely different character. Like, I don't think these are the same guy at all, because they definitely don't look like exactly the same fucking guy. Um, and they definitely aren't exactly the same fuck. They're the same guy. Like, I'm gonna call that right now that Skelemachius is, he's just Skelly again, but he's gonna be teaching Melano, I suppose. I do like the update to his character. And like, it also, like here especially, you can see the change in art style where Hades 1 had this very scratchy, kind of scrappy art style on a, on a bunch of its assets, on a bunch of its characters. Skelemachius, um, Skelemachius has decidedly cleaned up, right? And that also kind of matches the vibe of the character, is that Skelly in the first game was this kind of, hey, boyo, do you want to do some, do you want to do some training? Just punch me, boyo. <laughs> like, he's this little trickster, like, this little goblin character who's, like, always kind of, <laughs> like, chuckling and, and, like, running schemes and being a little bit skeevy and a little bit weird and a little bit, a little bit scruffy over in the corner, and Skelemachius seems very much like someone who's cleaned up his act, right? Like someone who is regal, who's like with the big red cloak and posed with like this, this like walking stick that like this old beard that makes him look venerable and ancient and like knowledgeable and smart. It's like, yeah, okay. So like it makes sense to clean up the art style for him as well, that he's not quite so scrappy anymore because now he's cleaned up his act. Um... So that's funny. Like, that's just funny that Skelly goes from this to this. <laughs> like, what a glow up. Careful of who you make fun of in uh, high, high hell. <laughs> um, but he's mostly also, I think, like much like Skelly in the first game, mostly going to be a comedy character, which is why he's wearing the medals on his ribcage, right? That's why he's wearing the obviously fake fucking beard, <laughs> which is why he's wearing like this ostentatiously huge red cloak. Um, like, it's, it's comedy, I think. Like, it's, it's, it's mostly just about that. It's mostly just about being a little bit funny in contrast to what he was in Hades 1. And that's all of the artwork, I think, of the characters that's been released so far. At least all of the artwork that I know about. And those were my reactions to it. So, um, yeah. Go watch my Let's Play of Hades over on my Let's Play channel, I suppose. I haven't, I haven't 100% finished the game. I still haven't 100% finished the story. Maybe I should do that at some point uh, before Hades 2 comes out properly. But I do know what happens in it. And it's a fun playthrough. I have I have a very good time with it. So you can do that, I guess. There'll be a video popping up on screen in the end screen uh, right about now because I'm about to say bye.